So about 10 or 11 days ago on uh, June 29th, my family and I wrapped up our 14th year here and we are now beginning our 15th year here. Yeah. You might look at my wife and say, we can't be that old. But, um, but you know, the interesting thing is that as I stand here, as, as we you know, start our, our 15th year here, I stand here very expectant of what the Lord is doing and is going to do. But here's the interesting thing about that. To stand here expectant, um, you would think that I had seen a lot of my expectations over the years fulfilled. But here's the reality. Almost every expectation I had when I first came here has been dashed. <laughs> Almost every single one. So, if all my expectations have been dashed, how can I possibly stand here expectant? Am I just slow in the head? Probably. But here's the thing. The thing is, is that the Lord has shown me that although all my expectations have been dashed, once I gave up what I thought should be and began to put my eyes on the Lord, the Lord has opened my eyes up to so many powerful things that He has done in our lives. I mean, so many of us ha have just been changed in radical ways. Now, does that mean we're any less dependent upon Jesus? No, absolutely not. We're just as dependent as ever. But look at the things that the Lord has done over the years, and it's unbelievable. But one of the things that the Lord has shown me is that if we are to live with hope that is expectant about what the Lord's going to do, one of the things that we must do is take our eyes off of expectations and simply put our eyes on Him. Because any time we start to think about how the Lord is going to do something, we will be wrong and we will find our hopes dashed. And that, is exactly where the enemy wants us. Because where we go when we get our hopes dashed is we fall into despair and we just want to give up on the Lord. We want to say, well, I must not be good enough or the Lord must not love me. And we just crawl in a hole somewhere. But the Lord wants us to live with a vibrant expectation. Because here's what happens when we crawl into that hole. What happens is we miss out on all the good things the Lord wants to do. Let me give you one example. We're going to go to Scripture in a little while and look at a different one. But just one example I want to throw out there. Think about Peter and the rest of the disciples. Especially Peter. Peter and the rest of the disciples were following Jesus. Hopefully, that's what we're trying to do here, is to follow Jesus. But one of the things that the enemy wants to get us to do is to take our eyes off Jesus and put our eyes on a cause or an expectation that we think God's going to fulfill and try to focus on that. And that's exactly what Peter and the rest of the disciples did. Even though they lived with Jesus and they followed Him physically, if you will, they had an expectation that Jesus was going to become the ruler of Israel and take over the world. That was the expectation. And so when Jesus was captured and then killed, what happened to Peter and the disciples? They went into absolute despair. And Peter said, said forget it all, I'm going to go back and go fishing. Now if Peter had stayed there, he would have missed out on the launching of the church as we know it today and all that it's going to become if he had stayed in that place of despair. But Jesus came back and He rescued him. He rescued him and He said, Peter, put your eyes on Me. He said, Peter, do you love Me? He didn't say, Peter, do you love the cause that we're fighting for? Peter, do you love Me? Are you sitting here this morning and, and you, maybe you've got some despair in you? 
Maybe you've got some expectations that have been dashed and you're wondering what's going on. Well, what's going on is that Jesus wants to call you to Him this morning. He wants to call you to Him and He wants you to put your eyes on Him and stop trying to figure out how it's all going to pan out and then working your tail off to make it happen. You know, I find that's what I do. When I get in my head the way something's going to turn out and, and, and it's not going quite that way, I will do everything in my power to try and manipulate and force everything because it's a good thing. Hey, it's for the Lord. And what I'll find is, just like Peter, I'm actually working against God. When Jesus says to Peter, get behind me, Satan, that's me when I've got my focus on some kind of expectation that I think God has endorsed. We live in a society that is consumed with causes. Look at the news. Look at your Facebook feed. It is full of causes. And some of the causes, you know what some of the causes? Some of the causes are the church. I mean, that's a cause, if you will. And if I focus on the church, which is the body of Christ, okay, it's a good thing. But if I focus on that and just building that, you know what's going to happen? My expectations are going to be dashed. And I'm eventually going to come to the point where I say, forget it. This is ridiculous. And that's how subtle it is. And it can feel like, well, if everybody around me has a cause, I, I, I've got to have a cause. Well, if you go that route, you will eventually find yourself in a place of despair. I don't care how good your cause is. And the Lord does it and allows it for a reason. Because He wants your eyes on Him. And when you put your eyes on Him, here's what happens. You live with an expectancy. What's going to happen? I mean, the Lord's doing something in our church right now. Uh, the man who spoke here last week, John Cook, I believe that the Lord wants to use him somehow. And I don't know what it is, but I am expectant. I don't know where the Lord's going to take it because I've found that when I start to do that again, I'll be wrong <laughs> and I'll try to make something happen and I'll actually ruin what God's trying to do. So I've just decided, forget it, in my more sane moments. And when you, when you step into that place, you get to be the child that has a loving father watching over you. And maybe you've never experienced that in the real world, but this is what Jesus wants to offer you in the spiritual world, and even in your physical world. When you wake up, and you take on the place of a child that says, I don't know what today brings, but I know my daddy loves me, and I know he's going he's gonna to do some good things. Now, he's also going to take you through some challenges that you're not going to like, but through it all, there are going to be some good things. And I just, the, I want to invite you into that. The Lord wants to invite you into that. What if you could live in that place again? You know, so many of us, as we grow up into adulthood, we lose that. And we say, oh, that's childish. No, it's not. That's, what, that's the way that God wants you living. He wants you living in that place where you wake up and you're like, woohoo, I don't know what today's going to bring, but it's going to be good. Now, that may mean you have to go back to General Tire or Big Muddy Prison for the 1,000 whatever day in a, you know, in a row. But you know what? What's God going to do during that day? You may do some of the same old routines that you've done over and over. But when you walk with an expectancy, God can do the miraculous in the midst of the mundane. I mean, think about Jesus. I mean, what was so impressive about His life? I mean, He was a carpenter. He lived in the middle of nowhere among a no-name people. There was nothing... I mean, it was very mundane. But yet, the miraculous happened in His life. Why? He did not have His eyes on a cause. He did not get up every day, gather a crowd around Him and say, All right, this is our cause. Who's with me? No. He separated Himself. He went out, and the Scripture declares over and over, He put His eyes on the Father. And He said, Father, 
you show me what you want me doing today. And the scripture declares that Jesus didn't even know all that he was going to be doing and when. Only the Father knew. And maybe that doesn't sound good to you if you're a control freak. But you know what? If you want to really begin to live, you've got to let it go. Where's Chris? Don't start singing. <laughs> you've got to let it go. And just put your eyes on the Lord. I'm telling you, it is such a freeing place to be. I want to look at Abraham. I want to look at Abraham, and I want to start in Hebrews 11. And I want to go to a place where Abraham had learned to be expectant. Even in the midst of it looked like everything was falling apart, he learned to be expectant. And because he learned to be expectant, God did something through Abraham that, that is just miraculous. He took a guy and his wife who were beyond the age of childbearing, they bore a child and then grew that child into the most mighty nation on earth. Unbelievable. Descendants, the scripture declares that we're like the sand on the seashore. But it was all because, it was all because Abraham finally reached the point where he said, Okay, God, I don't know how you're going to do this. This makes zero sense to me, but here's what you declared, and so I'm just going to follow you. Even though that what you're, what you're asking of me actually seems to go against what you've told me you're going to do. Amen. Let me give you an example of that. Um, and I've shared this with some of you before I get into the scripture here. But, you know, I... I Many of you know I grew up, my father uh, was a Mormon, and I grew up in the Mormon church. And at a young age, at the age of 12 or 13, I believe the Lord told me that I'm going to have an impact within the Mormon church. Now, the craziness is, is that the Lord has since led me right here. How many Mormons do you know? Probably not very many, okay? We're, we're, I mean, th this is not Mormon country, is it? I mean, the Packer family, they're out in Utah, Idaho. I've got all kinds of reason to be out there. But this is where the Lord says, I want you. Now, that seems insane. So what's true then? Did, was that baloney? Was that just something I heard and God didn't really speak that? No, I believe he spoke it. Well, then maybe I'm not where I'm supposed to be. Is it some kind of punishment that I'm, you know? <laughs> no, I mean blessing. No, I'm exactly where I'm supposed to be. How does it connect? I have no idea. But I'm expectant. Because somehow it all plays together. And that's what Abraham learned. And, and this isn't just for a few special people. This applies to your life. I bet if you will open up your heart, God has spoken things to you that at one time you were excited about, but maybe you've given up on it and you said, there's no way, are you kidding me? And maybe you're in that place now. And maybe you can't even remember what those things are because you wrote them off as that's ridiculous. You need to get on with life and just live in life. You know, earn a paycheck, take care of your kids, just live in life. Well, you know what? God has way more for you than that. Amen. And I don't know what it is, but He created you for a purpose. He has plans for you. But you must, you must embrace Him Lay your expectations down and say, okay, Lord, do what you want to do. Amen. Hebrews 11. The faith chapter. And if you're going to walk in faith, you must walk in expectancy. Verse 17 says, It was by faith that Abraham offered Isaac as a sacrifice when God was testing him. Abraham, who had received God's promises, was ready to sacrifice his only son, Isaac. Even though God had told him, Isaac is the son through whom your descendants will be counted. Abraham reasoned that if Isaac died, God was able to bring him back to life again. And in a sense, Abraham did receive his son back from the dead. So here's the scene, and, and, and we're going to go back 
um, to before this. But here's the scene. Abraham has been given this promise that he's going to be made into this great nation. Again, he is beyond childbearing years. God has blessed him with one son, okay, through his wife Sarah. And that's where he said that um, the nation would come from. One son, this one and only son. I mean, God's been doing all this good stuff, and then God says, okay, now I want you to sacrifice your son. That is the exact opposite of any rationale, logic, whatever. That makes zero sense. So why is God doing it? Because God wants, wanted to do with Abraham the very thing He wants to do with every one of us. And that is, He wants you to get your eyes off of your expectations of how you think things should go and put your eyes on Him. He will purposely bring about the things that He has spoken into your life in a way that you could never imagine. He will do it on purpose. If the Lord wants to give you great amounts of money... He's not going to do it in a way that you would think. He's going to put you in a job that seems like it goes on forever and doesn't pay squat. That's what he's going to do. He's going to put you through bankruptcy several times. I mean, this why? Because whenever we get our eyes on a cause, no matter how good it is, think about the disciples. What a cause! That Jesus would be king and rule. And you know what? There's truth in it. He's going to. They just had their timeline messed up. But what a cause! But you know what? It was wrong and it caused them to work for Satan. Amen. You could be working for Satan and his purposes by trying to bring about a promise that God has given you, but trying to do it in a way that he is not wanting to do it. And in so doing, you will fall into a place of despair if you don't finally give it up and say, okay, God, <laughs> uh, this doesn't make any sense to me, but I'm just going to start following you. That's where the Lord had taken Abraham. But understand this. It's not because Abraham is any better than you. It was a process. It was a process that the Lord took Abraham and his wife Sarah through. I want to look at Genesis 12. One, I'm going to kind of jump around here um, just to hear some of the promise that the Lord gave Abraham in 12.1. He said, leave your country, your relatives, and your father's family and go to the land that I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you and make you famous and you will be a blessing to others. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who treat you with contempt. All the families of the earth will be blessed through you. I mean, what a blessing. I mean, this is unbelievable. I mean, can you imagine hearing those words from the Lord? It would be like, I'm invincible. <laughs> I mean, everything I touch is going to turn to gold from now on. But you know what? That's not what happened. What happened was God didn't fulfill these things in the timeline that Abraham thought, and he went about it in a way that he would never imagine. And because of that, Abraham and his wife entered a place of despair. Now, they didn't enter the place where they said, this is never going to happen, but here's where they went to, and this is where I tend to go to. They went to the place that they said, okay, this is never going to happen without us you know, stepping in and making something happen. I, I bet you God is just waiting on me to do something. That's why nothing's happened yet. God's been waiting for me to, to get up and... I, I mean, because doesn't Scripture say God helps those who help themselves? No. Oh. I guess that was Benjamin Franklin. I thought that was in the Bible. No, it does not say that. That's exactly right. We come up with things like that and, and people spout it off and we think that's Scripture. No, it's not. And it actually goes against the whole heart and the direction of Scripture. You try to do things on yourself, yourself, you know what that's called? That's called pride. And what the Scripture does teach is that God is opposed to the proud, but He gives grace to the humble. So if God has given you a promise and then has not given you any direction, wait. 
Man, I need to hear that. It's easier to say it to you, though. In chapter 15, moving ahead a little further, sometime later the Lord spoke to Abram in a vision and said, Do not be afraid. I will protect you and re your reward will be great. Um, but then Abraham, Abram goes on and he says, Oh, sovereign Lord, what good are all your blessings when I don't even have a son? He had, he had received all these blessings from the Lord and been told all these things, but now he's reached a point like, who cares? You haven't even given me a son. I mean, that, that is the basis for everything being fulfilled, and yet you haven't given it to me. <laughs> so Abraham, or Abram, went from this high of, wow, God loves me. He's spoken all these amazing things over me. And now it's been years later and nothing's happened. And he's like, whatever. Since you've given me no children, Eliezer of Damascus, a servant in my household, will inherit all my wealth. So he's trying to open God's eyes up. <laughs> Do you not understand? That in order for all this to happen, I have to have a son. You have given me no descendants of my own, so one of my servants will be my heir. But the Lord came back and said, No, your servant will not be your heir, for you will have a son of your own who will be your heir. So he comes back and he says, No, this is what's going to happen. And he says, Look up into the sky and count the stars if you can. That's how many descendants you will have. Now here's the thing. When we enter this place of rationale and logic, we get tired of hearing things like that. We get tired of hearing somebody say to us, oh, child, look up into the sky and look at the stars. That's how the Lord's going to bless you. Okay, stop with the pie in the sky stuff. I don't have a kid. But you know what? When your eyes are on the Lord, you can have the expectancy of a child. But we see that now as nonsense. We see it as nonsense. You need to snap out of it and start living life. Go out and get a job and, you know, just make things happen. You do that and you are walking away from what the Lord wants to do in you. When you say, forget the dreams, I'm just going to do this. A man spoke to me recently, John Cook, that spoke here last time. And I was talking about how I'd reached a place where I'd given up on dreams. And I just, okay, I'm just going to do my job and so on. And he said, when you dream, when you stop dreaming, you die. Amen. And that's exactly where, what, what was happening in my heart. I, I was dying because I, I said, you know, you must dream. I don't care how many times you've been hurt. I don't care. I do care. I'm not, I don't mean it that way. <laughs> but what I'm saying is this. Yes, I know. As I said before, almost every expectation, and I, I was talking about this church, but you know what? In my life, almost every expectation of what I thought would happen in my life is gone. But you know what? God is good. Amen. Last night, my wife and I uh, were able to go to a rodeo. I didn't even know they had rodeos here in Illinois, but it turns out <laughs> once in a while they do. And, you know, in that moment, I'm brought back into what I pursued for years, you know, living in Texas and Colorado. I mean, that was my dream. But you know what? I sat there and, and Nikki asked me afterwards, you know, did, did it stir something? Do you want to go after it? And I'm like, no, I love the Western culture. I love horses. I, I love all of that. But you know what? I've learned my happiness comes when I just follow God. That's where it comes. And it doesn't matter where I live, because wherever I go, God goes with me. And wherever I go, He does things that I don't expect. And when I trust Him and just follow Him, they're really good. But when I try to make things happen, it gets ugly, I get discouraged, and I just want to give up on everything. It's a choice. Genesis 16. Now Sarah, Abram's wife, had not been able to bear children for him. But she had an Egyptian servant named Hagar. So Sarah said to, said to Abram, The Lord has prevented me from having children. Go and sleep with my servant. 
Perhaps I can have children through her. And Abram agreed with Sarah's proposal. So Sarah, Abraham's wife, took Hagar, the Egyptian servant, and gave her to Abram as a wife. This happened 10 years after Abram had settled in the land of Canaan. So they go on, they have relations, they have a child. Now think about this. Put yourself in Sarah's place for a moment. What a sacrifice. I mean, come on, this is huge. You've got your husband who is entering a place of despair because all that has been spoken over him is not coming true and she is willing to make the ultimate sacrifice. She's willing to give her husband to her servant. Amazing! This is where the enemy wants to take us as well. He wants to take us to this place where we say, okay, the God is obviously waiting on me to do something serious for this to, to happen. So I'm going to do the ultimate. I'm going to make a sacrifice. And then if you read on, what happens is it blows up and it gets terribly ugly. The servant, instead of you know, feeling honored and being grateful, starts to show contempt to Sarah. <laughs> and it, this mess happens and it just, oh, it gets so ugly. And imagine Sarah at that moment. God... I sacrificed the ultimate for you, and this is what happens. I mean, this is getting so ugly. This is what happens when we take our eyes off the Lord, we get our eyes on a cause, and by the way, that cause can be a promise that He has spoken, and we decide this is how I'm going to make it happen. It will lead you into a place of absolute despair. And at that moment, you have two choices. You either give up all hope and you let your heart die, and you just say, well, I'm going to go on and keep living. Maybe you keep attending church and bring your bitter self in every Sunday, and we're blessed to have you. <laughs> or, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I tried not to look at anybody when I said that. <laughs> or, you say, you know what? This isn't working. I'm 70 years old and this isn't working. I'm going to stop forming expectations. And I'm just going to put my eyes on the Lord and I'm going to say, Lord, you have your way. I'm going to listen to you and I'm going to do it even if it makes no sense. That's how Abraham got to the point that when God said, sacrifice your son, he said, okay. Because in his mind, he knew somehow, some way, God is able to fulfill his promise. And I know that though I stand here and it makes no sense that I would have an impact in the Mormon church, I know that somehow God's going to fulfill it. Somehow. And I don't know what your dream is, and maybe you've never even opened yourself up to hear those dreams. Maybe at an early age, you shut your heart down and said, dreams are for little kids. Well, you know what? The Lord's inviting you. And He's not inviting you to dream your own dreams, because again, that's your own cause. He's inviting you to receive His dreams, which He is able to fulfill, no matter who you are, no matter what your background is, no matter what you've done, no matter... It just doesn't matter. He loves to choose people that it makes no sense and have them fulfill something that makes no sense. You see what I'm saying? That He loves to do it. And as you look through Scripture, He does it over and over again. So, I want to go back to your life. Where are you at right now? Are you in a place that, you know, maybe you were excited about the Lord at one time, you felt like He was speaking things over you, but now you just feel like you're just gutting it out? The Lord's inviting you to receive His dreams. But you've got to open up your heart. He's speaking it, but you've got to open up your heart. And you've got to say, okay, Lord, I had false expectations, but I am going to live expectantly. Lord, thank you. Thank you, Lord, that you allow us to be kids. Oh, Lord, I, I, when I was a kid, all I wanted to do was grow up and, you know, have control and make my own decisions. 
And now, Father, all I want to do is just give it all to you and just live with the expectancy of a child. Getting up every day not knowing what you're going to do. Lord, I pray that for every person here. I pray that no matter how callous their heart has become, no matter how long their heart has been shut off, that they would just open it up to you and they, they would open up and just receive what you would speak to them and not try to make it happen. And for those who've been waiting forever and they feel like it's never going to happen, Lord, I just pray for the grace to just trust you and just to enjoy where they're at right now, knowing that they don't have to wait for the promise to be fulfilled to begin living but they can live right now in your presence and in the blessings you've given them. Lord, help us all to live in that place. In Jesus' name, amen. If you would